So we've looked at the Dan A4 in a couple videos previously on the channel. First was my initial review of the enclosure where I was seriously impressed with build quality and the overall optimized layout for hardware, but I was pretty underwhelmed when it came to the limited CPU cooler height of just 48 millimeters. A couple weeks after that, I showed you guys how we could run a 120 mil AIO in here if you were prepared to use an ITX sized graphics card and a slim fan. And thermals here were pretty decent, allowing us to run a delitted 8700K at stock speeds below 80 degrees C in an extended blender run. Now that was cool and all, and it definitely would have been my go-to setup for a case and CPU cooler, but that restriction of the ITX graphics card, I just could not move past. Essentially for improved CPU thermals, you are trading off for worse GPU thermal since you are going with a smaller heatsink on the GPU and only a single fan. And that's not to mention that only up to a GTX 1080 is supported in that form factor. So enter the Acertec 545LC. This is a 92 millimeter AIO, which can be mounted at the bottom of the Dan A4 SFX. And spoiler alert, the cooling capability of this thing is a lot better than I actually thought, but there are a few drawbacks as well. More on that later. Now, of course, if you don't care about small form factor systems, just get yourself a mid tower with enough cooling headroom for say a 280 mil or 360 mil AIO and call it a day. Systems like this though, I think are pretty exciting because if you do successfully cool your CPU and your other components, then essentially you've got a tiny system that can fit in a backpack. You can take it to business trips, LAN events, or whatever else you do. For me though, I will admit it really is about the process and the challenge of trying to squeeze as much cooling capability into a small footprint and volume as possible. But of course, I also enjoy just the minimal and cleaner look of a small form factor system. Anyway, let's first see if this thing is even viable before we get ahead of ourselves. So the Acertec 545LC is pretty compact and stealthy with matte black tubing and no branding at all, which I'm a big fan of. And speaking of fans, you will need to purchase one separately as the cooler doesn't come with one. And the most common option here is Noctua's Slim NFA9. The pump is also powered by a single three pin cable, so there's no mess of cables that you'll need to worry about there. Okay, now let's talk about installation and this is by far the hardest part of the entire process. And in the beginning, I was absolutely convinced that this thing would not fit. First, you'll want to install the fan onto the radiator before you put it in there. And the included screws just weren't long enough to secure the Noctua NFA9, but you can use a six and a half millimeter drill bit to let the screw sink in a little bit deeper. Or if you've got enough time, which I didn't, feel free to drop into your hardware store and get the correct screws. Now, you can mount the fan either in pull or push mode with the most common orientation that I've seen being push, but spoiler alert, having the fan acting as pull against the radiator performs slightly better thermally and will give you many fewer headaches. Once the fan is mounted, you'll want to screw in the rubber mounts on the bottom of the radiator, which will secure it to the case. Just start with the two at the front of the radiator and then put the remaining two in there once it's in place. You'll also want to remove the push pin mounting points as well for the side panels, as I found I couldn't fit the radiator in otherwise. Now the radiator is in, so go ahead and mount the pump block to your CPU. And here I initially had the tubes at the nine o'clock position on the block as close to the memory sticks as possible, but I do change this later by rotating it clockwise one notch to the position that you see here, as this allows the tubes to run their full length and fit much better. By the way, you'll also want to use low profile memory sticks like Corsair Vengeance LPX or HyperX Fury modules, as this will allow a few extra millimeters of clearance for the tubing. Okay, now for the hardest part, and that's squeezing in the power supply. I think I tried for at least a full hour here, and I'm honestly surprised I didn't burst the tubing on the AIO. There's no kidding here, this is an extremely tight fit. All of my previous PC building experience has been a piece of cake up until this point. So brute force is absolutely not going to work here, unless you somehow get lucky, which is unlikely. The only way that you're going to get that SFX power supply unit in there and without the cables touching the radiator fan is to get everything positioned in an extremely specific way. The first order of business is flattening your power supply cables so that they exit as flat as possible from the plug. 
I'd also recommend going as far as making sure each individual wire is not overlapping one another because seriously, every millimeter of clearance makes a huge difference here. I also found that sliding in the power supply through the GPU side worked best as the only way to get a comfortable fit for all of the hardware was to have the tubing routed in front of the wires, not underneath them or behind them. It's also recommended that you plug your 24 pin motherboard cable in before you start installing the power supply as I found it otherwise impossible. Okay, so the AIO is successfully mounted in there, but clearance between the fan and the power supply wires is a bit worrying. Just make sure there's no interference or contact before you power up the system. This is one of the main reasons that I recommend running the fan as pull against the radiator, as the frame of the fan will block any of the interfering wires coming from the power supply into the fan blades. So let's finally see how this thing performs. And let's start with the Core i5-8400 in a 15 minute blender run. And yes, 15 minutes was plenty for these tiny radiators and the small amount of coolant inside of them to reach equilibrium. And here we're seeing that the Acetec 545LC is the most effective cooling option so far that I've tested in this case. Keep in mind this stack also includes the 120 mm Corsair H55 that we've tested previously with a slim fan. I surely did not expect the 92 mm AIO to beat that. We can also see here that running the Noctua fan as pull gives us the top score cooling the i5-8400 to just 53 degrees C at an ambient of 20. The real question though was whether or not we could run something like the i7-8700K in this configuration and I'm happy to report that yes, you can and with plenty of headroom as well. Do keep in mind though that the 8700K that was used here has been delitted with liquid metal applied to the CPU die contact but even without the delit I'm betting that you could still run an 8700K here, it would just be in the low 80s. In the end, the 8700K settled to a 6 core average of just 65.4 degrees C during the blender render, leaving a bit of room for a potential 4.8 to 5 gigahertz overclock, depending on the quality of silicon in your CPU. I did test noise as well, and since we're using the Noctua NFA9 fan, you can expect these results to be pretty damn quiet, even at full blast. I'm happy to report the pump noise on the AIO didn't seem to add much noise here at all. The only time that I noticed the pump noise at all, or the AIO for that matter, was when initially booting up the system and hearing the liquid making its way through the tubing. Okay, so thermals are really impressive, but before you go and spend a ton of money on this configuration, because it is expensive, there are a few things that you should know. And the first one is the excess tubing on this AIO. You'll need to position the pump lock exactly as I show here to let the tubing run their full length and to ultimately get that side panel on. Otherwise, there will be quite a lot of tubing left over, which will otherwise need to be wrestled inside the case using brute force. Now, even with the side panel on and everything locked into place, the side panel still doesn't fit exactly flush with the top one. I will admit it's only a minor gap, but those with OCD should take note. Similar situation on the other side, if you're using the stock 24 pin cable like I am, then there will definitely be a lot of excess cabling underneath the graphics card, and this may also prevent the card from being fully seated into the PCIe slot. I am fairly confident though with some custom power supply cables that you would be able to get those side panels on nice and flush without any issue. That's something that I definitely plan on doing at a later date given the cooling performance of this setup. Another consideration that is very important in fact is that compared to a top-down cooler like the Noctua L9 or the Cryrig C7 which are both very popular coolers in this case is that with an AIO you've got no airflow at all going to your motherboard and that means that uh, components like your VRM and your M.2 drive if it is mounted on the front are actually getting no airflow at all and it means that potentially you could have throttling uh, on either of those components or in general you're just going to see higher temps. It's not something that I've personally tested but just an extra consideration for you guys. Now, otherwise, I am pretty damn impressed with this cooling setup. I absolutely did not expect the 92mm AIO to beat the 120 that I've previously tested in this case. And with the 92mm AIO, you've got a decent amount of headroom for overclocking on the 8700K. I think calling the Ryzen 2700X should be fine as well, but maybe you're not interested in overclocking. At the very least, this will support higher core count CPUs down the road. So guys, let me know what you think of this setup down below. I'm interested to see your comments there. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. And as always, guys, I will see you all in the next one.